Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. Okay. Okay. How you guys doing? You good? If you're not good, take a breather. Emotions are fickle. You'll be good soon. All right, let's get into it. If you're new to the channel, my name's Connor. Hello, I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link will be at the top description below. Discord link right below that. Love for you to join. Pull up a chair. Like to subscribe. All that stuff. Dislike if you don't like it. Just sit back. Enjoy the ride. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, this is another one of those conflicts I'm not aware of at all, really. Um, I can think of a lot of... I can think that Polish-Soviet conflicts would be very common... So let's get into it. Feature history, Polish-Soviet War. Who recommended this, by the way? I'm getting much better at, at getting into the uh, recommended at the Discord, which you guys should join. Love to have you. We're nice most of the time. We're... Here it is. Oh, it's Melkor. Thanks, Melkor. All right, let's get into it. Today, we're going to talk about when Poland won its independence. Won its independence from Russia from Russia in the 20th century. From Russia in the 20th century through the means of conventional warfare. There we go, thank you. I just want to say, I'll, first, if you're not ready to learn, there's the door, get the hell out. Nobody loves you, just go away. Unless you want to chill, that's fine too. But I just want to say, um, I'm over 1,500 subs. Thank you, guys. I'm getting close to 1,600, I think. I might even be past it. I don't know, but regardless, thank you guys so much. I went into this thinking, you know, just throw myself in there. You got to get through all the, you know, you're putting yourself out there for judgment and everything. And you guys have just been so nice and disarming and uh, just uh, helpful and, and everything. I, I just want to say thank you. i uh, love for you to join uh, and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. So that being said, let's get into it. You guys are great. Let's learn. If you're not ready, just leave. Hello and welcome to Feature hey. History, featuring the Polish-Soviet War. A war that came immediately after the war to end all wars. Ironic, isn't it? In fact, a lot of conflicts didn't even wait for the Great War to end before starting. The Russian Revolution, the rise of the Bolsheviks, and the period of a very confusing Eastern European map all started in about, eh, 1917. Of course, it wasn't just the Russians getting in on the fun. It was a whole Slavic salad of What's the difference between a revolution and a civil war? ...to end before starting. The Russian Revolution, the rise of the Bolsheviks, and the period of a very confusing Eastern European map all started in about, eh, 1917. Of course, it wasn't just the Russians getting in on the fun. It was a whole Slavic salad of conflict. And for this episode, we're shining the spotlight on our beloved friends, brothers, and plumbers, the Polish. Let's go back to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was a state that existed from 1569 to, spoilers, 1795. As well as being a mouthful to say, the Commonwealth was a fairly serious regional power. Hell, in the 17th century, it almost annexed Russia. But as said, it came to an end, as it had weakened further and further until it was partitioned by three empires. Russia, Russia, Austria, and Austria. Their sovereignty had been eliminated. Getting better. However, their culture never died. Polish nationalism would be a genuine concern for a long time. Skipping to the First World War, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia. Can I just give props out there to uh, Poland for existing? Because you have been on cornered on almost four sides, three sides, definitely two sides for almost all time, and you're still here. Just not many countries can go through that and say that, so congratulations. And also, skipping to the Respect. First World War, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia, and also the rest of the world, went to war. A plethora of fighting, dying, and destruction was suffered by the Polish as the empires engaged a back and forth across the region. It was frustrating, sure, but the Polish nationalists saw it as an opportunity for independence. The statesman Józef Piłsudski proposed that the Polish would have to be active in the war, fighting for an empire so that empire would fight for them. Which empire though? Well, you know. Yeah, that wasn't so clear. Germany and Austria-Hungary gave a shot at winning Polish loyalty, as they seriously needed it. 
From 1915, Germany had been pushing itself as the liberators of the Polish suffering Russian subjugation, because Germany would never subjugate the Polish. In 1916, the two empires, after talks with the esteemed Piłsudski and a Polish delegation, created the Kingdom of Poland, which even had a constitution, but no pesky sort of government or borders. The former would spawn in 1917, but Piłsudski foresaw Germany's defeat. If I could have a mustache like that, my life would be complete. And urged the former would spawn in 1917. But Pilsudski foresaw Germany's defeat and urged all Polish troops to not swear any oath, leading to his resignation and arrest. Regardless, through his actions the chance of Polish independence started to look more like a sure thing. Though of course Poland wasn't just a part of Germany and Austria-Hungary, but also Russia, who too saw its own fair share of the woes of war. In the Sardom of Russia, things had been going tits up for Nicholas II since 1905. Constantly urged to reform or resign, He'd constantly respond with crackdowns and middle fingers. The world war turned unrest to crisis, and the Tsar's days dwindled alongside every moment the war continued. It'll be fine. In February 1917, a women's protest would turn into a workers' protest, which turned into an army mutiny, which turned into a riot, eventually turning into the Tsar's abdication. The power of rule had been passed from Romanov to revolution. The seat of power rested in Petrograd, formerly known as St. Petersburg, before it was decided that German shit don't fly here. The State Duma, or National Assembly, set up a provisional government, but given the circumstance, their power was in fact shared with Petrograd's Soviet, or Council. The Duma would continue the war, which wasn't a great idea as people began to flock to the smaller Bolshevik party, whose leader, Vladimir Lenin, on top of promising to stop the war, promised the redistribution of land, destruction of the bourgeoisie, transfer of power to the local Soviets, and a bloody and brutal revolution. To make a long story a little shorter, October 1917 saw the Bolsheviks and their Red Army seize Petrograd in the name of revolution, forcing Russia's descent into all-out civil war. Well, hello there, feature history guy. My lord, is that THE Indian Idol from THE Great War Channel, which you can find at www. He's on a few channels, Time Goes History too. this guy's great. YouTube.com strike The Great War and enjoy new videos every Monday, Indian Thursday, Idol. and Saturday. That's a great name. Um, yeah, it is. In Sorry. Fact, war and enjoy new videos every Monday, Thursday, and Saturday? Um, yeah, it is, in fact, me. I came over here to tell your viewers that if they're enjoying learning all about the Polish-Soviet War and the Russian Revolution, that over on our channel, we have a new video about the Bloody Baron, who forged his own interesting tale in that conflict way over on the other end of Russia. Well, that sounds just marvelous. I think I'll be watching that myself. Also, where did my eyes go? Ah, don't mention it. Glad to have had you on. I can't see. No, seriously, I can't see. <laughs> Jeez, what a nerd. As the First World War came to a close, the map of Central and Eastern Europe changed drastically. Many smaller nations had seen a chance to break away from foreign powers, and the US President Woodrow Wilson made special note on Woody. Polish independence in his 14 points presented at Versailles. I, I don't know much about... I guess I don't know much about history at all. I'm learning, but alright, I don't know much about, you know, tiering US presidents, but I've seen a few tier lists by historians on YouTube. And Wil Wilson always seems to be in the lowest tier, if not the worst president. And, uh, yeah, I, I guess I get to learn a little bit more why, but uh, Second, I just thought I'd nations note that. had seen a chance to break away from foreign powers, and the U.S. President Woodrow Wilson made special note on Polish independence in his 14 points presented at Versailles. The Second Polish Republic was birthed with Marshal Józef Piłsudski at the helm. This new state, though, was a tad smaller than maybe it should have been. The Greater Polish Uprising in 1918. Didn't even this have a new state, though, was a tad smaller than maybe yeah. it should have been. The Greater Polish Uprising in 1918 saw insurgents attack the weak in Germany and pressure Versailles to grant them an expanded western border. The eastern border, however, well, those writing the treaty must have skipped the question and forgot to come back to it. The Bolshevik-controlled Soviet Russia viewed states like Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania as just temporary breakaways. Lenin was confident they'd come back for them, just as soon as the White Army in Russia had been defeated. Not only was this dispute a matter of de jure claims, but Lenin saw Poland as a bridge to Germany. And if the revolution was to continue, it was important the German socialist movement united with the Bolsheviks to create a communist Europe. So a freshly independent Poland was already threatened with annexation again. That didn't sit well with Pilsudski, so as the Russian Civil War dragged and the Red Army was bogged down, 
it seemed better to start now rather than later, and the Polish army made its first offensive in February 1919. The initial and disorganized offensive saw some victories and stalemates, being a slow but steady advance. This is awesome because it, it goes back to what I said earlier, just saying the fact that Poland exists in, in, in such a hostile place over the past few hundred years. And it's not a fluke, obviously, because they've, they're doing whatever they can to try and create it, even if they're not recognized borders or government. There's always this sense of, Polish identity, and they've been fighting for it, and again, they have it, and uh, yeah, it's impressive. Eastward. If this was to be a serious stalemate, being a slow but steady advance eastward, if this was to be a serious war, some work had to be done. A diplomatic effort was swiftly undertaken. Pilosudski dreamed of a federation of friendly states revolved around Poland. The support of Romania and Hungary agreed to send Poland arms, but for a military alliance, Poland only managed to prevent Ukraine or what was left of it after the Soviets had shown up there. Diplomacy wasn't the only struggle. Logistics cold. And God was she ugly. The infrastructure and army of Poland was almost like it had been built by... Sorry to pause again. Also, if any of you guys have a... I, I guess I could find one. It's better if you guys come up with one. You know a better video than I will find. But just, you know, all this stuff with, like, uh, Crimea today, and, and I know Kiev, or Kiev, however you pronounce it, I just think of like Kiev and Ru I just I'd like to know the just the history between Ukraine and Russia, and you know if they can they understand each other Ukrainians and uh, anyways yeah sorry off topic but I'd like to learn about the history of the relationship between those two countries. And God was she ugly. The infrastructure and army of Poland was almost like it had been built by three different empires. What Poland did have though was spirit, and you know that actually did count for something. In sure. early 1920, the Polish and Ukrainians began a southern offensive against the Red Army. Pilsudski claimed it was an effort to restore the Ukrainian state, but the fact of the matter was this alliance was purely temporary. The Polish and Ukrainians hated one another. They took some easy victories entering the abandoned Kiev by May 1920, however, around the same time this civil war had begun to wrap up. Lenin believed it was the end of the Red Army's defensive war, and now it was time to begin an offensive one. Lev Trotsky, his Commissar of Military Affairs, disagreed with the westward charge so soon. But tough shit, it was his job to get it done. The front, from the Soviet perspective, was to be split between a northern Polish one and a southern Ukrainian one. Trotsky's job was to coordinate this joint offensive between, for the sake of simplicity, let's say, Mikhail Tukhachevsky in the north and Josef Stalin in the south. Facing a now organized, outnumbering and direct oh. opponent, a string of Red Army victories forced the Polish into retreat, as the Soviets aimed to, in Tukhachevsky's words, move onward to Berlin over the corpse of Poland. Poland's only effective resistance was their ability to intercept Soviet orders. Using this and their legendary cavalry, they harassed the enemy in a guerrilla-like fashion. Panic looked to grip Polish resistance, however, and Pilsudski only managed to pull in the reins at the almost final moment, as the Red Army drew nearer and nearer to Warsaw. Now the French, UK and US looked to support Poland in small ways, now seeing the threat of the Soviet advance. The Polish people also prepared to throw everything they had at the enemy, because everyone, armed with anything, was going to fight. At the same time it seemed there was an issue in the Soviet side, because as Tukhachevsky prepared for battle, Stalin's army was still in the south, besieging Lvov. He was determined to take the glory of having seized the city, and against orders continued the siege. Stalin may have sabotaged the battle for Warsaw before it even began. Regardless though, Tukhachevsky still had a reasonable chance of taking the capital, and so Pursudsky looked to employ an audacious plan. Interestingly, the Red Army would intercept this, and thought it was so silly that it was just an attempt to deceive them, dismissing it. Once the battle commenced, every Polish person, and even some not Polish people, gave it their all in the defense of the city. Pursudsky had set up his army almost stupidly close to the enemy's south, and so, when he caught the Red Army off guard and launched a counterattack, the offensive was completely disrupted and the army routed. The Polish took a decisive and important victory. It wasn't enough to rout the Red Army though, it had to be destroyed. The legendary Polish cavalry took on the attackers of Lwów. In what would be the last cavalry battle in history, the Battle of Komorów, the really? Soviet cavalry, ten times in number, were decisively defeated. Destroying the, the Soviets ones, were? The Soviet cavalry, ten times in number, were decisively defeated destroying the once feared Red Army as an effective fighting force. At this time, Trotsky was attempting to sue for peace, presumably telling Lenin, I told you so. 
the Polish continued to chase Tukhachevsky's army, leading to one last battle where Poland took one last victory. After that, both sides were deeply exhausted and Piłsudski, under the pressure of the West as well, accepted the request to negotiate. The Peace of Riga was signed in March 1921. The it's Polish the stuffed their faces in the treaty. Ilnius, and did a brilliant job March 1921. Riga. The Polish stuffed their faces in the treaty and did a brilliant job screwing over the Ukrainians, as Ukraine was split between the Soviets and Poland. Piłsudski himself was only able to observe and denounced the peace as an act of cowardice. It permanently destroyed Poland's relations with neighbouring states and made for a ticking time bomb between the Soviets and the Polish. The new eastern border was militarily indefensible. Interesting. That makes more sense about now that it makes more sense the uh, the pact between Hitler and Stalin to take over Poland. You know, to partition Poland. It makes sense seeing how they had bad blood with the Polish, the Soviets. That's what I love about this. Learning it connects different events in history, and it's very gratifying. Time bomb between the Soviets and the Polish. The new eastern border was militarily indefensible and economically unviable, and this put a real dampener on their victory. Poland did achieve something a little less superficial though. In the defense of Warsaw, not only had they gatekept their country, but also the rest of Europe from the spread of communism, causing the Bolsheviks to shelve the idea of a war for communism. They also had affirmed themselves as a new, strong, and independent Poland, one the world had not witnessed in centuries. And yes, the Second Republic did end in 1939, and they spent much time as a Soviet Republic, but that was reversible. If they had fallen in 1920, well, who's to say what would have happened? And truly, it is for the best that Poland stood tall. As without that, how could I have wasted an entire month playing Witcher 3? Remember to check out the Great Wars video on the Bloody Baron Ungern Sternberg. Great video, great channel. Uh, love learning about conflicts I know almost nothing about and have them connect separate historical events, which is just so satisfying. Um, yeah, great video. See you guys next time. Subscribe, Discord, all that stuff. See ya.